Tell the person next to you, tell them that they are better looking today than they were yesterday. Now I know that might be a complete lie. And I know we shouldn't lie in the house of God, but hey, it makes you feel good anyways, right? I am well over 50, I won't tell you my age, but I'm well over 50, and it's hard watching the creases and the crevices creeping in. The other day, my, my, we call it our sciotic, psychotic, our, my psychotic sciatica nerve was giving me grief, and I bent down to get some of my granddaughter's toys off the ground, and the thought entered my mind, while I'm all the way down here, I wonder what else I can do. But hey, we do anything for our grandkids, amen? Richard and I have four married children, and we have four granddaughters, beautiful granddaughters. How many are grandparents in the house? Yeah, I can see a few hands. How many of you love your grandkids? That's good. <laughs> Aren't they just the best? Yeah. Amen. Well, don't kill your kids because the better ones are coming. <clears throat> hey. <laughs> The other day, I had a friend of mine, uh, she contacted me, and she said, would you speak at our ladies' breakfast? And I said, sure, I would. And then she said, would you send me your bio? And can I tell you, it, it took me like two hours to write like six lines of my bio. I felt super awkward. I love talking about my kids, and I love talking about my grandkids. But when I talk, came to talking about myself, I, I just felt super awkward. So here's my bio. Margaret Clark has been married to Richard for 37 years, and she should get a medal for that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I didn't write that. <laughs> I didn't write that. Don't tell Richard I said that. <laughs> they have four married children and four incredible granddaughters. She is a certified life coach, a mentor, and a life map facilitator. She also enjoys working with Poppins, professional organizers, and like Marie Kondo, she loves messes. More than any... Oh, you guys don't get that. You have to watch Marie Kondo <laughs> if, you, if you get that one. Okay. Uh, more than that, she gets energized when she helps individuals walk in their God-given potential. So as I'm writing this, I felt like I was putting on this front. I wasn't really telling them my whole story, that I have a backstory, that I have messes. I think part of the reason that I felt awkward is because every January I like to pick a word of the year. Most people pick New Year's resolutions, like lose 30 pounds before they go to Mexico or learn to play the ukulele or climb Mount Everest or whatever. That's all a little bit too much for me. I tried the gym. It lasted like nine days. I love music. But to be honest with you, uh, Richard and I got kicked off the worship team. I guess we can't carry a tune. And uh, I think I'm a little bit ambidextrous, so I like to do both things with, with both Two th or same thing with both hands, that's the way it goes, right? And uh, so I think playing an instrument might be out of the question. So instead of New Year's resolutions, I resort to one word. It's usually a word that I pray about, and it's usually an attribute or a characteristic that I really feel like God really wants me to work on. So one year it was believe, and another year it was courage. And for the last couple of years, it's been the word authenticity. So while I'm writing my bio, I really want to be real with these ladies. I don't want to just put on airs. I don't want to make it sound like I'm somebody that I'm not. But at the same time, I don't want to seem like a dork or like a complete loser either, right? I want to be real. I want to be authentic. I want to be genuine. And I think that that's what God wants. And I think that that's what people want too, right? The other day, we had some people over for breakfast. You guys would be super impressed. I, and it was just perfect. It was absolutely perfect. I had soft, enchanting music playing in the background. I had banana coconut pancakes, which were absolutely my favorite, with whoop cream, as my granddaughters would say. And uh, the table decor was amazing. And uh, I got a beautiful flower for my uh, birthday. And so it was just beautiful centerpiece. And all my cutlery matched. We have like three patterns in our drawer, and usually um, it's lucky if you get the same pattern. So anyways, um, and even w I didn't even have grungies. You know, usually we have a little bit of grungies on our cutlery from our uh, dishwasher, but I didn't even have grungies on it. Everything was just, honestly, it was just perfect. But part of me just wanted to just say, it's never like this. I know it's, it's just perfect, but it's usually if you come back tomorrow, it probably won't be like this, 99 
99.9% of the times, it's usually there's something out of place or something's messy about the whole situation. So when I'm writing my bio, I just wanted to say, I am all these things, but I am also a mess. Yesterday, my neighbor texted her husband and said, windows frozen, won't open. Well, it's pretty cold. Anyways, he texted back, gently pour some lukewarm water over it and gently tap the edges with hammer. My neighbor texts back five minutes later, computer really messed up now. <laughs> I thought Keith Donahue would appreciate that one. <laughs> so anyways, life is messy, right guys? Life is messy. In Genesis 1 and 2, we read about God and how he created the heavens and the earth. For six days, he created, right? First day, he made what? Girls from the Bible study. What did he make? Light, right? He made light. Second day was water. Third day, he was land and the varieties of vegetation. The fourth day was the sun, moon, and the stars. The fifth day, the creatures, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, right? The sixth day, he created Adam and Eve. He created man and woman. After each day, what did God say? It was good, right? Within all of creation, there was rhythm, there was order, there was harmony, and it was good. It was really good. In chapter 2, it goes on to say, describe the garden, the beauty of Eden, the gold, the aromatic resin, the onyx. The garden of Eden wasn't just good. It was perfect. It was perfect. Everybody say perfect. Everybody say perfect louder. Perfect. It was perfect, right? Just think about that for a moment. Nothing out of place, nothing out of order. Everything was beautiful, everything in sync. I can only imagine, I won't break into song. I can only imagine. <laughs> then we know that God said to Adam and Eve, you may eat of any tree except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And of course we know what happened. Satan tempted them and what did they do? They, they ate, right? And as a result, they were banished from this perfect place. That one move made life very complicated and very messy because the human heart was created in the context of perfection in the Garden of Eden. Each one of us has perfection etched into the very DNA of our souls. The problem is we don't live there anymore. It's no wonder we get frustrated, we get disappointed, we get disillusioned, we get despondent, despairing, and depressed, right? Everything in life isn't quite perfect. We taste snippets of what we assume perfection is, but it is nothing compared to the Garden of Eden. Just think for a minute on your wedding day, your fiance, oh, she was so beautiful, or he was so handsome. The day went off without a hitch, and then life happened right? Then in-laws happen. Then babies happen. Then gravity happened, right? Then hair loss happened, right? And then, and then, and then. Part of us just wants life to be this pretty package tied up with a beautiful bowl. We have expectations, and then we have experiences. When our expectations don't align with our experiences, that's where frustration grows. That's where disappointment grows. We have it in our relationships. We have it in our church. Well, not this church. <laughs> we have it in our neighborhood. Well, maybe not Dave's neighborhood. We have it in our children. Well, maybe not your children. We have it in our school systems. We have it in our government, right? And at the same time, we have a general sense that life should be better than it is, that people should be better than they are. We listen to the news, we hear of another shooting, we hear of corruption in the government, we look at our community, we see kids dying before their parents. We have friends that get scary di diagnosis. There's a general sense in all of us that life should be better than this. The weather should be better than this. <laughs> Guess what? You're right. It wasn't supposed to be this way. The human heart was created in the context of perfection, the Garden of Eden. The problem is we don't live there anymore. In the very last book of the Bible, in Revelations, 
It says that we're going to go back to perfection. Revelation 22, the actual the subtitle over that chapter is Eden Restored. It goes on to describe a beautiful place teeming with life. Church, do you know why life is so hard for us? Because we live between two gardens. We live with the anxiety that the first garden has ended, and, live, and we live with the anticipation that there is a, a garden that's going to be restart, restored. And here we are between two gardens. Without even realizing, we do this thing called pining. We are pining and longing for the perfection of Eden. So now we have a deep desire to reconcile, to resolve, or to make sense of this imperfect world that we live in. My father-in-law used to go to Tim Hortons and him and his Dutch mafia buddies used to try to solve all of the world's problems. But after the first brew, they figured out, this isn't going to work today, let's come back tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe some of you can relate. We have expectations on how life should be, and then we have those experiences. And if those expectations and the experiences sync up, that's amazing, right? We love that, right? I expect to go to Sobeys and, and uh, buy my Good Haven um, bread, and when it's on the shelf, I'm a happy girl. But when it's not there, then I have to either order it, or I have to wait till tomorrow, or uh, whatever. And yeah, I'm kind of disappointed, but hey, I can make a little adjustment, right? And sometimes that's the way it goes. I can just make a little adjustment. Sometimes there's just easy solutions, and it's not perfect, but there's an easy solution. But what happens if my expectations and my experiences are far apart? Pastor Dave mentioned this scripture in Jeremiah. He's a well-known prophet in the Old Testament. He actually writes in this book called Lamentations. He's lamenting in this book called Lamentations. How befitting is that? Um, in Lamentations 3, verse 17 uh, to 20, it says, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering. The bitterness and the gall, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. I well remember comes from the word ruminating. We start to do this thing called ruminating. Ruminating uh, is when we, our expectations don't fall in sync with our experiences. We ruminate. Ruminating is what cows do, right, Mr. Becker? Right. They chew they swallow, they regurgitate, we ruminate. Chew, swallow, regurgitate. And they keep doing this over again. Chew, swallow, regurgitate. And every time they regurgitate, it gets a little grosser. Right? Right. So when I do these life maps on Life Map Day, we call these things prevailing thoughts. It's like the hamster on the wheel syndrome. Round and round and round it goes. And until we can bring some resolve to it. On Life Map Day, we say what we don't resolve, we reproduce. So here's Richard. He's at the trade show right now. You're wondering, where is her husband? Uh, he's supposed to be um, you know, being my best fan right now. But he's at the trade show. He's standing at the trade show, and this guy comes up to him. And uh, Richard's selling uh, pivots, rinky pivots, and he's also selling uh, underground sprinklers for um, landscapers. So he's at the trade show and he's talking. This guy comes up to him and um, asks them about, sp about sprinklers and as such. And uh, while he's talking, all of a sudden, um, this guy starts talking about the messy divorce that he's going through. Uh, divorce is a big thing and it's on his mind, right? And so what's happening with his prevailing thoughts? It's the foremost thing on his mind. So it's like the hamster on the wheel, right? It's going round and round and round. And it's taking up a lot of his thinking, right? It's taking up, we, we say, the mental real estate, right? It's taking up a lot of that mental real estate. So what comes out at the trade show is he's standing in the middle of the trade show with Richard, burying his soul, all of his dirty laundry and all of the messy things that are happening with his divorce. Because those things are like a beach ball. If you try to keep all of those things submerged, like his messy divorce, um, somehow it just keeps popping up in the most inopportune places and the most awkward 
places and the most inopportune of times, right? That's what happens. It's like a beach ball. We try to keep it submerged, but then it just kind of pops up behind us or, or beside us, right? In the most uh, inopportune of times. So I want you to listen to this story. It's from the Edmonton Journal. It says, on June 1, 2000, this is a true story, on June 1, 2002, 75-year-old Robert Stanley was killed when a basketball-sized boulder crashed through the windshield of his charter bus he was driving. Anybody remember this story? The rock had been dumped over the side of a pedestrian bridge onto Edmonton's white mud freeway as a prank by two teenagers. It would be years before the police tracked them down and charged them with manslaughter. This is a follow-up article. This is four years later. Reiterate the story and then goes on to say, the boys at the time agreed to a pact not to talk about the incident again, but one came forward when the wrong person was charged with a crime. In youth court Tuesday, the second teen received the same sentence as the first a six-month house arrest, 18 months probation, and 240 hours of community service. What just happened there? Two 15-year-olds pulled a prank thinking it was an innocent prank, not realizing the ramifications of their actions, right? What was the first thing that they did? They hid. They hid the truth. It took four years for one of them to come forward. What was the first thing Adam and Eve did? They hid. They hid they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then they were banished, and they hid. God wanted to walk with them. He wanted to talk with them in the garden of perfection, the garden of Eden. But because of their sin, they were banished from the garden, right? Life from that moment on was changed forever. And I'm sure they had regrets. And when we have regrets, we say, woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? Woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? And I'm sure that these two teenagers had regrets. The problem is regrets don't bring resolve. Most of us don't wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to throw a boulder over a bridge and kill someone, right? Most of us don't wake up in the morning on our wedding day and say, I can't wait to sign my divorce papers, right? Most of us don't wake up in the morning, go to the bar, drink and drive, and say, I can't wait to have a head-on collision, right? Last week, a friend of mine drove into oncoming traffic, and the driver of the other vehicle was killed. I am positive that she did not wake up last Wednesday morning and say, I can't wait to hit icy roads, plow into oncoming traffic, and kill the driver. Regrets don't bring resolve. But what does bring resolve? The day one of the 15-year-olds walked through the doors of the police station was the day when resolve started for him, for the family, for the police, for the community. What did he do? He confessed. The first, the first step of resolve, the first step towards wholeness is confession. Can I tell you, God is in the business of wholeness and authenticity. He knows and we know we will never be perfect, but he's in the business of wholeness and authenticity. I absolutely love how in the Bible God tells on some of his favorite people. Did you ever notice that? He tells on, for example, on David. David has an affair with his um, best friend's wife. When, he, uh, when she finds out he's, she's pregnant, uh, he tried to make it look like it was his friend uh, was the father, when that didn't work, he had his friend murdered, right? After all that mess, God, what did God say? That David was a man after his own heart. He adored David. God didn't Photoshop people in the Bible. He loved messy, broken people. He knows that we're not perfect but he also has a plan, and wholeness is his plan. Here's the contingency, contingency story. I cannot speak. Contingency story. The Bible says in James, if we confess with our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Maybe unrighteousness isn't a boulder from a bridge. Maybe it's 
fear, or maybe it's insecurity, maybe it's comparison, or maybe it's envy, or maybe it's gossip, or maybe it's unforgiveness. God wants to drive that out of you. He wants to drive that out of me because he knows it's not healthy for us. He knows it creates more messes, right? There's a saying that confession is good for the soul, and that is true. There is a burden that is lifted when we are truthful about our brokenness and our sin. And you know what? That's great. When that 15-year-old walked through the door of the police station, something lifted, a weight lifted from him, a, a weight of guilt lifted off his shoulders. And like the saying says, confession is good for the souls. But how many of you know that confession should always lead us to repentance? If we confess but we keep living in sin. How fruitful is that? Is that very helpful? Confession breaks the power of sin, but repentance connects me to God's, the power of God's grace and to his love, right? 2 Corinthians uh, 7 verse 10 says, God designed us to feel remorse over sin in order to produce repentance that leads to victory, that leaves us with no regrets. Listen to this. This leads us, leaves us with no regrets. So what are we learning from this? Confession needs to lead us to, uh, to repentance so that we don't have regrets. Right. The last article in the paper about the court case mentioned restorative justice. This is what it says. This is so cool, you guys. When Caroline Gosling sat in on community conference that was sentencing one of the teens, something surprising happened. Instead of anger, the sentencing ended with hugs and handshakes and something approaching understanding between Stanley's family and the teen. That moment and others like it convinced Gosling of the value of restorative justice. So what is restorative justice? Restorative justice is a method of resolving disputes that addresses the harm caused by the crime or the conflict and promotes meaningful resolutions. It lays out a format where a willing offender and a willing victim come into a room and they talk openly about what happened. The victim shares about how the crime impacted them and then the offenders are held to account for what they have done and how they will make amends. So resolve began for this 15-year-old when he walked through the police station, right? When he confessed. But the real healing began when the 15-year-old repented. I'm not a Greek scholar. I barely know English. But I, re um, but I uh, researched the word repentance. And repentance actually comes from the word meta, M-E-T-A, and no A-O, N-O-E-O. -E uh, meta means uh, uh, after, and no A-O means to understand. In other words, after I sinned, I understood my sin differently. After I sinned, I understood my sin differently. It doesn't mean, I'm so sorry, end of story, you know, when you're kids. Sorry, you know, just that shallow apology, right? Um, <laughs> It means I see that I was wrong, my behavior was destructive, and here's what I will do differently next time. It means that I was wrong, and my behavior was destructive, and here's what I will do next time. Matthew 3, and I, there's a new version that's coming out in the Bible, and there's lots of great versions. It's called the Passion Translation. It's such a great translation. It says, in Matthew 3, it says, you must prove your repentance by a changed life, or the fruit of your repentance is a changed life. I started this message telling you about my bio and just the desire to be real and authentic with people and that my life was messy, maybe a different messy than your messy, but messy nonetheless. And then we talked about living between two trees. And even though our hearts are etched, even though... And even though our hearts are etched with perfection, in reality, we will never know perfection on this side of heaven, right? So how do we navigate? How do we navigate through imperfection? I really felt like the Lord say, just be honest. 
be real, be authentic. And the pipeline to authenticity is confession, is repentance, and is forgiveness. And here's what I know. Jesus loves hanging out with messy people, people who are willing to be honest. He was so kind to the adulterous woman in the Bible, but he didn't have time for the Pharisees or the religious leaders who looked so good on the outside, but their hearts were hard. The world is saying we're tired of fake. People looking so good on the outside. We're tired of fake news. We're tired of cover-ups. We're tired of scandals. We're tired of lies. Just give us something real. Just give us something authentic. Maybe, um, maybe not as real as Dr. Pimple Popper. You guys see that show? It's gross. You should just check it out, just, just to get a gross, just be grossed out. But real and authentic nonetheless. The world is craving authenticity. They're just, they just want, they're just saying, just own it. Just own up to it. You are not perfect. You will never be perfect. I love what Andy Stanley is a pastor in the States. He says, either you were a mess, you are a mess, or you're one decision away from becoming a mess. The Bible says, as, God, as a God follower, you're also instruments of righteousness. So what does that look like? Instruments of right living, right? I love Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley goes on to say, in light of your past experiences, your present circumstances, or your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? This, the 15-year-old who threw the boulder over the bridge, he confessed his crime. He went through restorative justice process where he uh, admitted to the crime. He became aware of his actions, how they impacted the family, how they impacted the community, how they impacted himself, how they impacted his future. I just think this is amazing. Later on, this is so cool, later on he spent those community hours going with Mrs. Stanley to different school assemblies and they talked about the crime, how it impacted them and the restitution that they made. It's a miracle, it was a complete miracle. The pain was really real and it's probably still very real for the Stanley family, but in the midst of it, they got some resolve. How do we bring some sort of resolve to this imperfect world that we live in? Own it. Be honest. Be authentic. Be open. Be open with God. Be open with others. We all have nicks, scrapes, and loose screws. Some of us just got into the hospital ahead of you. Here's what I didn't tell you. While going through the restorative justice process, process both the 15-year-old and the Stanley family had support people in the room, people who walked with them, who talked with them, who held their hands through them, who, who held their hands with them and encouraged them. We cannot do life alone. Our tendency is to hide, to pull back, to go into, sh to hide in our shame and to withdraw. But look at the healing that took place, and this is a real miracle. James 5, verse uh, 16 says, confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another, and then pray for one another to be instantly healed. For tremendous power is released through passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. There's the NIV version. Maybe this is a little more familiar version for some of you. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. At the end of this restorative justice process, both the parties said it was the hardest thing they ever did, but it was the best thing they ever did. Authenticity is hard work. It's often painful, and it often means exposing our guilt and our shame. But as, but as hard as it is, it is the best thing we can do for ourselves, we can do for our children, 
that we can, uh, we can model for our children. It's, it's the right thing to do. And right now I have a sense the world around us is craving and hungering and thirsting for authenticity. Church, let's show the world the beauty of authenticity. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray for a moment. Lord, help us to run to you with our imperfections, to crawl onto your lap, to write into your lap, to look into your eyes, to be God honest with you, to be real with you, to confess our messes, our mistakes, which in essence is sin. Lord, help us to, to turn away from our own solutions and acknowledge your solutions. And Lord, just continue to penetrate our hearts with truth. In Jesus' name. Amen.